Please also keep yourself muted throughout the presentation so that we don't have any background noise during the presentation. Uh, if you'd like to ask any questions, please enter it into the chat, chat box, but we'll be waiting to answer any of the questions until after the presentation. Uh, we did receive a lot of wonderful questions, so thank you to those of you who submitted those. Um, so we'll be going through those as well. It's your choice whether or not you choose to share a video of yourself. And if you happen to be experiencing any technical issues, please send a personal chat to either Becky or myself, and we will do our best to help you as quickly as possible. Uh, with that said, oh, we're really excited to introduce to you Hannah Weber. Hannah grew up in Southern Maine, uh, playing in the seaweeds of Casco Bay. She is now the Maine Ecology Director at the Skudik in Institute at Acadia National Park and a PhD candidate at UMaine, studying seaweed ecology. When not working on research, stakeholder engagement, and scientific communication, Hannah is savoring the outdoors of the Down East Maine. Uh, she lives in Surrey with her family. I hope that everybody enjoys tonight's presentation. And with all that said, Hannah, I will hand things off to you from there. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks to, to Ruth and Drake and to the Kennebec Estuary Land Trust for inviting me to give this talk tonight. Um, obviously, seaweed is something that I'm super psyched about. So I'm happy to be sharing that with you all tonight. Um, so like Ben said, I am the Marine Ecology Director at Skudik Institute at Acadia National Park. Um, what is Skudik Institute? Uh, Skudik is a nonprofit partner to Acadia. Um, I am learning how to switch slides. Um, uh, we focus on engaging people in research, education, and solutions for our changing ecology and our changing world. As Ben mentioned, I'm also a PhD candidate at um, UMaine in the Ecology and Environmental Science program. I study rockweed ecology throughout the state of Maine, um, and I'll be speaking a little bit later on about the, the work that we're doing. So I did get curious about seaweed spending a lot of time in the intertidal zone with my siblings and my cousins in, in Casco Bay when I was a kid, and then with fellow naturalists when I got older, and then you know with my fellow researchers now. So this has been sort of a, a, a lifelong love, maybe. I mean, the love of my childhood was, was balling up seaweed and throwing it at my brother and my cousins, but you know, I guess, right? Love takes different forms. And when I was a kid, it was throwing seaweed. So that's my start. Um, here's sort of where we're gonna go tonight. Um, I figured um, we'd talk about seaweed biology really quickly, and then we're doing this virtually, right? So we're gonna sort of have this, this sort of virtual walk down to the shore to hang out with some of the over 250 species of seaweed we have here in the Gulf of Maine. We'll talk about rockweed maybe a little bit more than we talk about the other species of seaweed. We'll talk a little bit about some other seaweeds out there in the world, but not much, gotta admit. Um, and then we'll come back to shore and talk about how we use seaweed and then end up with um, a little bit of time for some seaweed art. Um, we'll be talking about it, we won't be making it. Um, anyway, uh, I do want everybody to just keep in mind that we're gonna walk down to our imagined you know, main shore because Mysterious and little known organisms live within walking distance of, of where we sit, not just in the intertidal, but that's what we're focusing on tonight. And you know, splendor really does await anybody who's willing in these minute proportions. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna have a, a quick little video now to sort of orient us. We often go into the intertidal, of course, at low tide when we can, when it's more accessible to us. But of course, there's a whole world of intertidal um, seaweed at high tide. So we're going to spend a little bit of time just getting ourselves oriented with a quick video. There's no sound to it, so just sort of have a little moment of peace. Or if you need to let your cat in, your dog out, take something off the burner, finish making your coffee or your cocktail or your soda pop or whatever, feel free to do it now. Um, we also keep an eye on, on the, the video. Here we go.
So thanks for humoring me with that. Um, you know, we saw some floating seaweeds in there and some seaweeds that were glued to the rock and then some floaty things that, that could be phytoplankton um, were, are more likely to be, uh, you know, among other things, little crushed up pieces of seaweed. And I think we should back up a little bit and, and talk about, you know, what, what is seaweed? You know, it might seem like it's kind of basic, but maybe we need to sort of um, talk about that. And to talk about what is seaweed, we need to even back up a little bit more and talk about what is algae. Because remember I said the first part was gonna be biology. So you have now entered seaweed biology, algal biology 101. Here we go. If we looked at the tree of life, of course, this is a, you know, a, not necessarily a tree unless we're looking straight down on it. Um, we'd see that sort of all the plants are over on, on one branch, right, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, but the algae aren't. The algae are all over the place. Um, so algae are not on the plant branch because they're not plants. It's, it's almost blasphemous to say so because often people will say plants and actually I have a slide later on that came from another source and they use the word plants to wait for it and sort of go, I saw the plant slide bad uh, when we get to it. But anyway, right now I wanna say, um, I put up these images of sort of like a plant and then algae and there's no one image of algae because you know they're, they're unicellular and multicellular and maybe I'm being a little unfair to plants to make my point but all plants are multicellular and they all have a vascular system, you know, that tube-like system for, for moving water and nutrients. Most of them have roots and they all have cells that are organized into like a tissue level of structure and sometimes even organs. You know, one plant also can have these totally different parts, leaves and, and roots and flowers and fruits and, and seeds and cones, et cetera. And algae don't. Algae have simple body plans, and we won't find an algae with, with flowers or, or you know, these different structures. We just won't find that. And then we have you know, plants that are sort of fixed in place, and some algae are as well, like rockweed, um, it, but some also float in the water, and some have like these little flagella that they use to actively move. And other algae sort of move by sort of pushing their bodies or crawling along. Algae don't have that vascular system. You know, each cell in algae has to obtain its own nutrients directly from water for survival. We all know that plants have these incredibly crazy, cool, multicellular ways to reproduce. You know, they need sometimes, you know, wind and birds and bugs, etc. Algae, mm -mm, no, comparatively, they. They, you know, they reproduce, reproduce through like spores or, or replication or growth of, of broken pieces. They don't have that whole, let's find a flower and let's make a seed and what, they don't have that. Really simple. Um, you know, so algae are found typically in water, but they could be found in, in land or in snow or, you know, growing on the furs of sloth. It can be found anywhere. So, we can say that, that algae photosynthesize, but even not algae do that. So even that, we're like, uh, what is it? So algae, algae is really this catch-all phrase for what doesn't fit into anything else. You know, so it's sort of photosynthesizing and non-photosynthesizing relatives of photosynthesizers that are really morphologically simple and they have super simple sex lives. So that's kind of what algae are. Um, so what's seaweed? Seaweed is actually, ha ha ha, seaweed, like S-E-E, -E, like I see you, um, which is dorky, but that's life. Uh, seaweed are algae that are just visible to the naked eye. They are algae that we can see. Um, and seaweeds, just like all the other algae, are all over the tree of life as well. They fall largely into three groups, and these are groups based on the pigment types that they have. So there's the greens, the reds, and the browns. Um, let's start with the, the greens in the, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Um, so green seaweed like plants, and these are 
these are the algae that we think gave rise to the plants or on the same you know, part of the tree of life as plants. Um, you know, they have that characteristic um, photosynthesizing pigment, you know, it's chlorophyll. And you know, their phylum is called Chlorophyta. So that's what they take their name from. And there's about 8,000 species worldwide and largely about 90% of them are freshwater, not saltwater. Um, Ulva lactuca is one of our ocean examples, and that's the one that you see up in the upper right-hand corner. We'll talk about ulva again in a second. Reds, the red seaweed sort of moving up to about 12 o'clock on, on our tree of life. Um, they have other accessory pigments besides just chlorophyll, um, and that allows them to absorb light and use light over a broader spectrum of the, the, the visible light spectrum. Um, and this is Chondrus crispus. It's a common, of course, intertidal um, seaweed here in, this, in the state of Maine. It's sort of got this geographic range that's largely North Atlantic, um, but goes down into the Mediterranean and West Africa and the Azores as well. Um, and it lives for, just as an aside, lives for like two to six years. Um, but some people consider that the holdfast could live longer than that and, and keep regenerating. Um, the brown algae there over at like eight o'clock, let's say, um, third kind, and it has a totally different type of accessory pigment, the carotenoids, and sort of similar to like tannins that you would find in your wine. And the example I have here is Fucus spiralis. This is a, a, a brown algal species that you would see way up high in the inner tidal. It can spend like 90% of its time out of the water. It can lose like 80% of its water content and still come back to, to life. Um, and it too has a, a sort of North Atlantic rocky shore distribution. So seaweeds are algae that we can see with the naked eye. They're not plants. They live all over the world. As I said, we have about 250 species here in the Gulf of Maine. Um, they're limited by light, how much light there is in the, in the water column. Uh, there's some red algae that live down to um, about 295 meters, and that's sort of the deepest one we know of. And of course, they live up where they can spend, you know, 90% of their time out of water. So they've got a huge range. Um, here's sort of the seaweed basic structure, but Really, a lot of the seaweeds that we're going to look at tonight, of course, won't have the structure, so it's kind of hard to talk about the basic structure. Um, many of the ones that we'll be talking about do have a hold fast down there at the bottom. This is the glue that keeps seaweed on rocks. Um, again, uh, algae don't have and seaweed don't have roots. The hold fast is a, is a gluing disc, um, a polysaccharide gluing disc that keeps the seaweed um, glued down. Um, it's got a body that's sometimes called a phallus. Sometimes uh, seaweed will have, will have fronds or a blade, and then the thing that sort of looks most like a, a trunk um, is called a stipe. Some seaweed have this float or air bladder that keeps them erect in the water column, and some of them don't. Uh, but that's, that's our, our basic body plan. Um, now that we know what we're talking about, algae that we can see that of this basic body plan, super simple sex life. We're gonna go dig around in some seaweed. So this is sort of the start of our, our virtual our virtual walking tour. Um, and of course, anyone who has ever gone to the beach in the state of Maine knows you have to walk over that rack line if you wanna like put your towel down somewhere, you know, and then you move that rack line and all these little hoppers come out and and whatnot, um, you know, little little amphipods and they jump into your dip with your chips. It's horrible. Um, but, and you know, if you've ever moved any of this stuff aside, it's dry on top and then it's really slimy and gross on the bottom. Um, it's breaking down and becoming part of, you know, this larger carbon and, and nutrient cycling when it's, when it's breaking down. Rack lines are of course wave tossed or storm washed up onto the rocks and onto the beach and, um, you know, support an incredible diversity of life. So, the rack line is sort of this all you can eat buffet for animals like birds. And of course, um, it gets used by farmers, large and small, on, on crops of all type. It's used, you know, obviously the birds are, are eating 
the bugs that are breaking down the seaweed, but the, the farmer, you know, is going after the seaweed itself because it's an excellent soil conditioner. It's an excellent fertilizer. And um, although fresh rack is better than, than older rack, it's also a great mulch. Um, so if you are out and thinking about using seaweed as a mulch, um, you should plan on using between four and six inches on your garden for mulching to really hold in that soil moisture. Um, you should be aware that you need to know the landowner where you're getting the rack because you really need their permission to remove rack from their land. Rack is considered of the soil here in the state of Maine, and that means legally it belongs to the upland landowner. So uh, that was my little public service announcement in case you want to use rack, which is really, really good for your garden. Um, we're going to keep going. And the next thing that we'll see as we're sort of walking down to the water is, you know, this, this stuff that looks really sad when you come across it um, on a rock. Uh, but this is Porphyra umbilicalis. And it's sort of the nori that we will find um, in the state of Maine, in the Gulf of Maine. Um, again, so this is a red algae. It's in the upper intertidal zone. And that means that when the tide goes out, this is another species that can be out of water for a super long period of time. And just, I mean, just think, think about this. Think about you on a, on a hot sunny day, sunny day, you're laying on a rock, like for several hours without water. Um, and, you know, this species can lose up to 95% of its water. And I mean, if we lost 95% of our water, you know, we would look like, we would look like this. We wouldn't look so good. Um, so, you know, this is this extraordinary capacity that this species, as well as other species have. Um, porphyra is also known as laver, and it's used to, of course it's used for nori, but it's also used to make sort of laver cakes, which are, um, sort of laver mixed with oatmeal that then uh, fried up uh, for some, like it's a delicacy. I think it's an acquired taste, but you know, for some it, it's deeply appreciated. And um, nori is of course farmed. It's farmed extensively um, in Japan and China and Korea. And for the longest time um, in these countries, especially in Japan, they had to grow the seed out themselves and they, they really did not understand how to, to grow um, nori from seed or porphyra from seed. Um, in the 1940s, there was a researcher in England who discovered that this, this other species of, of algae, coconellus, which we thought was a totally different species, was actually the juvenile form of porphyra. And she, she died sadly after making this discovery, but the Japanese celebrate her every single year on April 14th because, and they call her the mother of the seas because, you know, without this knowledge that this thing that everybody thought was totally separate was actually the baby version of porphyra, there really would never have been the aquaculture of porphyra that there is now. So she really, the, the research and the results of her research really allowed that to, the cultivation to really take off in a commercial way. Um, we're going to keep moving down our mythical inner title. Um, this is a green algae and snails, all of those little brown dots, they're all snails and they go crazy for this stuff. This is, um, this is Ulva intestinalis. It's also called gutweed. Um, Sometimes the green algae are difficult to tell apart, especially when there's bright green. So I'm going to talk about to the gutweed and, and sea lettuce or ulva intestinalis and ulva lactuca. Um, the ulva lactuca, uh, you will see it in big mats in upper intertidal pools. It can withstand an incredible uh, array of conditions, both in salinity and in how much oxygen uh, or how much carbon is around and, and warm water, cold water, et cetera. Um, it's a tubular green weed. Um, and if you watch it for a bit, if you're out there with like uh, yourself or your, your other person or, or your children 
and you just watch it for a while, you can actually see oxygen bubbles coming off of it. It's very cool to be like, that's photosynthesis, that's my oxygen. So it's pretty exciting to, okay, on a slow scale, it's pretty exciting to watch. Um, and it's actually, uh, wherever you find alva intestinalis, if you have somebody who's totally into fish, it's a great place to find stickleback fish, um, three-spined and nine-spined. So if you're out there and, and you're looking for something to do, you can always go catch sticklebacks. Um, it is edible. It's uh, called green anori. And it's not really, it's, a, it's an annual here. It's not really harvested in the state of Maine, but it is completely and utterly edible. Um, here is sea lettuce or ulva lactuca. It's just, it's beautiful, um, highly edible. It's only a couple cells thick. It's very edible. Um, you know, you can find recipes using ulva from all around the world. So, and I've got to say for here in this neck of the woods, if you're into it, it's a great addition to, if you, if you dry it out and crumble it up, it's a great addition to pesto and homemade guacamole. It really does add that little bit of umami and um, yeah, it's a really good addition to, to any of your sort of, yeah, guacamole, pesto, pretty much anything, frankly. Um, we're gonna keep moving down our imaginary walk here. And we're gonna walk over some Ascophyllum nodosum or rockweed. This is, um, this is, this is the, my study algae. Um, so always it seems like if you wanna, you know, go down to that tide pool that you see or something, you're going to, on the, on the coast of Maine, you're going to have to walk over Ascophyllum or rockweed. Um, rockweed is the dominant seaweed on the rocky shores of the coast of Maine. Uh, it's got a, it's got a, a range that is North Atlantic. Um, it's found sort of in that, that, that mid-tide area, and it's considered to be sort of a foundation species. So um, a foundation species is something that is super abundant, and it, it doesn't eat things. It's not eaten. This stuff doesn't really get eaten all that much, if at all, but it creates habitat for all of those eat or get eaten or competitive interactions to happen. Um, at high tide, it forms this amazing sort of branching 3D space. And at low tide, it blankets the rocks so that um, it sort of traps in moisture and keeps the temperature cool so that little beasties can, can go about their business without desiccating. Um, again, here's the range, sort of North Atlantic. Uh, and I should mention that um, it's not something, it is not something that we eat directly, but rockweed's been harvested throughout its whole range for hundreds of years. Um, it's an excellent soil conditioner and it's used in animal feed and it can be mixed with other seaweeds in, for human consumption, not a lot of it. Uh, it's used in veterinary medical products. Um, and I've got to tell you that banyan and and Greenpoint are fabulous places to see beautiful rockweed. In both of those locations, I mean, seriously, I was saying this before we got on the, the, the call, that um, the conditions at both places are just absolutely perfect for rockweed to grow. So um, go down there and it's, it's just lovely. I know this type is small. This is um, from the early 1900s. And it says, you know, how would you like to be a seaweed gatherer? And then in this fine print, it said, you know, the men are wet to the skin all the time. They eat cold lunches. They sleep out of doors. They average to work 15 hours a day. So, um, you know, people have been gathering this for a long time and using it in commercial applications. Um, yeah, forever. So... And that sort of, I'm gonna take a little detour from our, our virtual tour and talk about the research that I'm involved in. Um, we're interested in, in the harvest levels that happen now along the coast of Maine. And we're really trying to, um, to characterize you know, the ecosystem and the potential uh, for harvest to, to influence the ecosystem. We have sites from Cundy's Harbor uh, up to Cobbs Cook Bay. So basically sort of the, the northern part of, of Casco Bay up to Cobbs Cook. And we work with private landowners and we work with harvesters, we work with regulators and, and resource managers to, to move 
you know, toward answers to these questions about how does harvest influence this, this ecosystem. And we're looking at this from a sort of a base level and the invertebrate level and also sort of the top predator bird level um, to, to get at this, to get some answers. Our basic design is that um, we worked with harvesters so that they went out and harvested half of our sites and the other half of course have been left as control sites and we collected data before any harvest did a harvest in 2019 last summer actually into last fall and we will be monitoring the progress for of of regrowth for any change uh, between the two tests you know control and impact until next year and in next year we'll wrap up our study and then start publishing our results um, we have worked extensively with citizen scientists to help us collect our data. It's been super fantastic to be able to work with, with landowners and other citizen scientists who just want to learn more about, you know, our coastal resources. We're in the middle of developing um, a larger effort to sort of expand out from just where we're doing our research to understand the amount of seaweed of rockweed that is along the entire coast of Maine and actually Ruth and Kelt have been a really good partner in helping us develop the protocol to do that work. So thank you. Um, so citizen science has definitely been a huge part of, of the work we've been doing. We're going to step away from research now and keep going on our on our virtual tour. And we've we've gotten to this tide pool, which is which is great. Um, yeah, so we're looking at this and it's just a lot of stuff. It's like, you know, is this a garden or a jungle? I don't know. You know, we have these, we have these sort of land-based words to describe these things. And I wish that we had some ocean-based words, but you know, we, we can either go with garden or jungle, take your pick. Um, but we're gonna dive into it and starting to break down this picture a little bit. Um, up here in the upper left-hand corner, we have Fucus vesiculosis. It's also called bladder rack. Um, you'll find this in a lot of like health and beauty products. And um, it's also, I mean, in some places it's eaten raw. Uh, I wouldn't recommend, well, I mean, none of the seaweeds that I'm pointing out tonight have are toxic. I often, you know, I'm out there in the inner tidal munching on it. Um, raw for the most part, this just tastes like salty rubber. So, you know, it, it might be a seaweed that's better used in like beauty products and whatnot. Um, but anyway, that's Fucus vesiculosis. Uh, you can identify this in the inner tidal. It's got these flat fronds and then it has these pair of air bladders, sort of like puffy little balls in its, you know, in that, in that blade or in that frond and they're right next to each other. So it's, it's sometimes easily identified. Um, moving on in this, so we have um, Saccharina latissima. This is also sugar kelp. Um, this is extensively farmed in the state of Maine. So when we are seeing all of those images of those long lines of, of kelp being pulled up over the, the edge of a boat, it's probably going to be sugar kelp. It's probably going to be Saccharina latissima. Sometimes it's really frilly on its edges. Sometimes it has those two rows of, of dimples going down. Sometimes it doesn't have either of those things. So um, variable in its, in its morphology. Um, sugar, sugar kelp, farm sugar kelp um, grows, well, all sugar kelp grows mostly in the winter. And so for the, for the coast of Maine, this is kind of a good alternative crop for people who are working on the water or doing other things in the summer season to have this other source of income and this other source of employment in the winter season. So with a primary growing season in winter, this makes a really good alternative for a lot of um, people who spend most of their working time super busy in the summer. So we're going to go down now to just this this little nubbin because if you've been to a tide pool on the, the, the coast of Maine or in other places, you often see this pink staining on the rocks on in a tide pool. And here's a, a little close up of it um, down here, sort of at three o'clock on your screen. Um, and so this is Lithothamnion, it's a crustose coralline algae or a CCA. Um, 
it does need calcium carbonate to form its itself and so it does it is probably more susceptible to ocean acidification because it it needs that calcium carbonate to form than some of these fleshy or green algaes. So it's something that we're paying attention to in terms of a changing climate and changing um, ocean chemistry to see, you know, how do these um, crustose coralline algaes hold up where we have changing acidification. Um, often we think about coral reefs. This is where I'm going to go out of Maine sort of. We think about coral reefs because corals form these major structures on the reefs, but these crustose coralline algae sort of act as the glue or the cement that holds sort of those, those bricks of, of corals together. So it really is kind of a combination of coral, which is an animal, and these seaweeds, you know, this crustose coralline algae that really hold um, coral reefs together. So it's really kind of like a coral and algae or a coral and seaweed reef, just saying. So um, moving along, I mean, as you're looking at this, you see this flat pink, but then right next to it is sort of this branchy pink. This is um, Coralina officinalis. Sometimes this watch, it washes up and it, it just bleaches right out and you'll see these really articulated bleaching structures um, up on the rack line or when you're just walking along the beach. And this is what you're finding. You're finding the remains or the dead, um, you know, Coralina officinalis. We only have one articulated coralline, not crustose coralline, but articulated coralline in the Gulf of Maine. And this is it. Um, I want to just jump over to that that seaweed that's sort of at the at the upper right. Here's another another view of it over here. Um, this is Chondrus crispus. So chondrus, you may have seen it before as you have, have looked into a tide pool and, and seen this iridescence and gone, what, what is this iridescence all about? You know, and usually you, you have to yell over other people so that they can come see the iridescence. Um, and that is indicative, that is a, that's a marker of chondrus. And what it is, is actually there are, there are layers of, it's not pigment, it's, it's layers like this, um, I'm blanking on the word, I apologize. But uh, it's basically a, a covering over the seaweed that refracts light in different directions. So it is not pigmentation, but it is a part of the seaweed that can be sort of removed microscopic layer by microscopic layer to, to have that iridescence um, get taken off. And there's a lot of research happening now around, you know, using pigment like the, pardon, using these, these um, layers like this to combat um, ultraviolet radiation, which is an, an interesting line of research. Um, chondrus is commercially harvested. It was first like, on a large scale commercially harvested or, or used in the 1940s um, to keep cocoa in suspension in chocolate milk. So if you had chocolate milk and it didn't have um, the carrageenan from the chondrus in it, like you would go buy your chocolate milk and all of that cocoa would have settled to the bottom. Um, just of course, have to shake it up, but still, um, that's, that's not really the most amazing chocolate milk that you want to have. And so this, this carrageenan that's extracted from chondrus really kind of forms like this jelly-like bubble, invisible jelly-like bubble around every single sort of piece of, of cocoa to, to be able to keep it in suspension. And that power of carrageenan is also sort of the basis of, of um, blancmange, which is a, a white pudding. Um, this is an acquired taste. Um, I, I like it. I think it's a, some other people kind of find it bland, but um, I think it's I think it's pretty good. And you you take you you do take the seaweed out. You don't eat the seaweed. Um, but it, what happens is when you've put this into the boiler. Um, what's happening is that all that carrageenan and all of that thickener is coming out of the chondrus and, and going into your, your pudding. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to bring our scuba gear, be able to, or even our snorkeling gear. So we really can't get out into some of these, these deeper um, algae, sort of the, the, the kelps, 
P at the end, kelps of, of the, the Gulf of Maine. But we do have um, Agrum cribrosum. You may have seen that also washed up. It's called sea colander. And it is really like got a very holy blade. Um, we also have Laminaria digitata, which is horsetail kelp. And so, um, you know, it comes up, it has a nice stipe and then really broadens out. Someone told me it looked to them like a menorah the other day, which I thought was interesting. Um, but then comes out and has, you know, multiple fronds off of, off of one, one stipe. And then we have Alaria escalenta, um, which is also called winged kelp, which um, is, is edible and harvested along the, the whole coast of Maine. So, you know, these things, they're out there. You will find them washed up. And if you go snorkeling, you'll certainly be snorkeling in them. You know, they're taking up carbon from the ocean and they're supporting urchins and fish and shrimp and myriad other organisms here on the, the, the coast. So not only did we not bring our snorkeling gear, but I really don't want to spend a lot of time on some of the invasives that we have. Um, like I mentioned, we have a little over 250 species. We only have a few invasives. Um, Codium is dead man's fingers, and I think that's the one that most people are most familiar with. Um, but I think the most interesting thing about these invasives is that, like in this picture from Nova Scotia, we have, we have these massive blooms, and then actually we have these declines. A few years ago in some of the beaches in York County, there were a, there was a lot of wash up of, of seaweed, of algae, and you know, it was just stinky and disgusting, and people didn't want anything to do with it. Um, and that's, you know, it sort of comes and goes in waves. Uh, Codium was sort of introduced in like the early 80s, and you know, had this big boom, but in the last several years, it's had a decline. And that seems to be what's the most interesting thing about these invasives is that they have this increase and then this decrease. Um, in the southern part of the, the Gulf of Maine, Dasysiphonia japonica is, is sort of taking over the kelp beds, the subtitle kelp beds. And where we might have had these beautiful and amazing, you know, 12 meter tall, um, you know, kelps, we now have this really short and stubby, Dasi siphonia. About you know, about twenty years ago, there was a boom of this stuff in in Norway, and now it's it's completely subsided. So it's hard to know what the trajectory for us will be with with these invasives. Um, before we sort of head back up through our imaginary intertidal zone, um, I just wanted to point out sort of. You know, in the in the left hand side of of ocean part of this picture, you see this sort of gray brown um, amorphous thing, and that's actually a floating mat of seaweed. Um, and you know, this, the seaweeds will get ripped up or they'll be torn, and they they float, and so they will float on ocean currents and pushed by the wind out off of shore. So storms and other disturbances will tear them up and then off they go floating on the currents. And as they're floating, they're, they're, they're carrying and they're attracting invertebrates and fish and birds. You know, so Linda Welch from Maine Coastal Islands um, National Wildlife Refuge has said that, you know, there can be miles of these floating mats of algae and animals out where there are ocean current fronts. Um, and I bring this up also because, you know, we've talked about sort of, you know, the seaweeds, but what are, what are they doing in terms of, are they doing anything for, you know, carbon capture or, or carbon sequestration or anything like this? And those mats float out to sea and at some point they stop floating. And then they do sink to the bottom of the ocean where the, you know, they break down farther and the carbon is sequestered in the deep sea. So there are ways that kelp and other macroalgae can help us. They're not a panacea, they're not gonna do everything, but can help us with addressing the, the carbon issue. There's also work on, on biofuels made from, from seaweed, not just you know little algae, but macroalgae. And of course, although this isn't the same timeline of sequestration, when we take seaweed out of the system and incorporate it, thoroughly incorporate it into our soil, 
um, for the short term, it does get sequestered in the soil. That is not a long term, not a super long term, like in the deep sea solution, but it is an element of short term sequestration. So there, there are some applications for, um, for addressing carbon and global climate change with seaweed. So I did want to, here we go, we're going back up over the, the rack line. This rack line looks a little different. We've got some, some um, saccharina in there. We've got a whole bunch of different species in there. And of course, seaweed has this, this life as, as gorgeous living algae, um, but it also, of course, gives life once it's sort of torn away from itself, whether it's out in the ocean or whether it's here on the rack. And so, you know, what else eats seaweed? Uh, a lot of seaweeds have developed chemical defenses against herbivory. Um, I think I mentioned rockweed is not terribly edible, but some seaweeds, of course, are highly edible and they're consumed by snails and chitons and limpets and, and urchins and, and fish. And of course, we eat seaweed. So um, we eat seaweed in all different forms. Um, down in the lower right, actually, there's your, your chocolate milk for you. Um, but uh, the kelp pickles, those are from Alaska, and I've got to say they're really good. Um, you can buy Maine made uh, seaweed salad that's just absolutely delicious. And, um, you know, so consumption, human consumption of seaweed, of course, is, is traditional. It, it's traditional in, in Japan, in Korea, Hawaii, you know, China, Iceland, Norway, Ireland, England. Scotland, pretty much everywhere, Western US, Eastern US, um, New Zealand. It's even, uh, you know, a traditional food in some South American countries. So um, eating seaweed is not, is not novel. There are novel applications for it. Um, and it's just loaded with amazing and incredible things. And we think about eating it, but it's of course also in toothpaste and ice cream, those thickeners. Again, if you go to, you get your Ben and Jerry's and you look on the back, you will see carrageenan in there. So again, that's, that's the, the extract from, from chondrus. So, you know, we have algan gels that are used in, in wound dressings because they, they keep burns and, and other wounds moist. Often they're used in burn applications. Um, you know, these are used sort of as a sort of a thickening or gelling agent in, in, you know, pharmaceuticals and sometimes as a blood expander. And they have incredible uses. I think we've really not tapped um, what we can be thinking about algae for. And I want to actually mention here that if you think about growing algae, like we don't need fresh water. We live in salt water. We don't need to fertilize these things. We don't need to, to like feed them anything. So when we think about the amount of input that goes into to getting a product out and seaweed is very high in protein as well, I should mention. Um, you know, we're getting a lot out of these alga without having to do the work and put in the chemicals and, and use this fresh water that we would have to for a lot of other um, crops and protein sources. So um, that's my little that's my little plug on that one. Um, these are the the kelps that are and the, the seaweeds that are commonly harvested here in the state of Maine. These are sort of the top ten: um, saccharina, latissima, and the the skinny kelp form are both eaten directly. Alaria is is dried and eaten. Of course, dulse is you can eat that. Basically, you can just munch on it right out in the inner tidal, or of course, dry it out and and use it in other dishes. Chondrus is is used for a thickener, but it's more an industrial application. Laver or the porphyra is is eaten. Um, alva, it's eaten. Ascophyllum and fucus really are 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 not, they, and I probably shouldn't be. <laughs> Although you know, if you want to try them, please do. But, you know, so, and then there are a whole bunch of other uses that people have for, for seaweed. You know, if you just look at this list, like, really, you know, and acid tablets or, or wallboard joint cement, you just, 
Seaweed is, is everywhere you never thought it would be. Um, I just want to example, you know, here's an example, and Fenori is, is a seaweed extract and it's, it's not something that we would come across here, um, but it is used as an adhesive and it's also used as packing material. So here's um, some bark art from, some Aboriginal art from uh, Australia. And when they wanted to ship it for, to, to um, China for this art exhibit, what they used to stabilize each one of these pieces of priceless bark art was this, this glue called Fenori um, that's usually used in kimono preservation, but they found that for packing and shipping, it was, it was completely appropriate and kept the right amount of moisture and everything for the shipping of this bark art. So just another example of, of how seaweed is used. Of course, it's also used as, as fodder. Um, you know, there are, you know, for, for sheep and cows and, and horses, and there are good records of, of, you know, using algae for fertilizer in France and in Ireland and in Norway, you know, from like the 12th century onward. So, you know, used just like this. And I think if you go out to the Nash Islands, you'll see the sheep out there also eating, eating seaweed. Um, and I, I want to wrap up and I want to just sort of think, you know, here we are, we're eating it. We kind of, you know, we went on our little virtual tour down to the shore to look at it and just appreciate all these different shapes and forms and colors. But of course, we can also sort of capture it with art. Um, this is the work of, of Anna Atkins. She's really kind of considered like the, 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 the mistress of, of cyanotype and she was uh, alive in the 1800s and created just some extraordinary cyanotypes of not just algae, but that's she's mostly used for, uh, known for. And But I want to point out is that if you want to make your own cyanotypes, you can. You can go down to the, to the shore. It's better to use sort of washed up seaweed, but you can, with permission of a landowner, um, you know, take little, little pieces and make your own cyanotypes. You can do this art. Um, and it's a good way to just sort of capture what you've seen down at the shore. Um, this is artwork, this is Ascophyllum, this is rockweed. And this is um, art from Jennifer Steen Boer. She's up in um, Mount Desert Island. And she uses, you know, just a, a, a light box actually that she created, she built herself to capture the, the beauty of, of seaweed. And similar to her, this is um, Josie Islin's work. And she uses a flatbed scanner to, to make these images. Um, but um, you can use like a, a kitchen tub and um, you know, a, it's a cell phone. And I used for the bottom image, I just used, you know, a, an app called Snapseed to kind of like try to, you know, get rid of the background and change it up a little bit. But I mean, you can do this. You can make your own seaweed art. Um, this is a, a main artist. Um, and you know, you can go out to the shore with your art supplies and and create art like this from what you find out there. Again, this is Rockwe, just want to point out. Uh, and I'm gonna end with probably my favorite piece of, of seaweed art by the late Cape Dorset artist, um, Kanozuak Ashevek. And this is um, rabbit eating seaweed. And it was done in 1959 and um, yeah, I just really appreciate this piece of art. Um, and with that, I wanted to sort of thank Kelt for inviting me to come give this talk. And I hope that you all get out there to enjoy seaweed and um, and I'm happy to answer questions. Awesome, thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. Thanks so much, Hannah. Um, I do have a list to questions, some questions people submitted before, and there are some that were shared during the presentation today. Um, so the first one is, is there a good seaweed ID guide that you could recommend for the coast of Maine? <laughs> so I'm not, I, um, so Glenn Middlehauser, who runs the um, Maine Natural History Observatory, Observatory is working on one right now. So. He's the person behind Plants of Acadia National Park and Plants of Baxter State Park. And he is now working on sort of the definitive seaweed guide. Um, I like um, Life Between the Tides, which was John Mooring, uh, Les Watling, and Jill Fegley. 
Um, it's an older book, but it's, it's, it's a lovely book with really good descriptions. So Life Between the Tides. The artwork is um, by uh, Andrea Solzer. So just a really lovely book and doesn't just cover seaweeds. Thank you. Yeah. Um, someone asked, are there any toxic varieties of seaweed along the main coast? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. In their living form, no. Um, but sometimes when the, you know, when seaweeds wash up on shore and they start breaking down, they can create toxic um, compounds just through the breakdown process. Um, and so uh, if you're incorporating those into other things, you might want to just think twice about it. But if you are, if you are foraging for yourself and you are foraging living seaweed, there is, there isn't anything toxic about it. Um, seaweeds have a lot of iodine in them. So I wouldn't dine solely on seaweed. And seaweeds can, if you're foraging for them in an area where there's like, you know, industrial waste or nearby, then they will accumulate heavy metals. But that's a question of where you're collecting from. If you're collecting from a largely pristine area, even the, the, the toxic metal uptake will be low. Thank you. Um... We had a question about if there have been changes in the species of seaweed in Maine over the past 25 years. Yeah, so those have been, there have been those invasives that I, I pointed out. And so Dasi Siphonia is, is definitely sort of the, the newer kid on the, the block and really kind of wreaking havoc in the southern subtitle part of the Gulf. Um, like I mentioned, you know, Codium has, has come in. I guess that's more than 20 years ago now. Um, heterocyclonia has, has come in and um, Guadalupe has come in. Uh, but nothing, so if we're thinking also about climate change, nothing has expanded their, their distribution so far northward that they've left the Gulf. Um, so in that regard, we still have the same suite. Um. What strategies do seaweeds have for managing salt in their tissues? Uh, I, have, I don't know. That's a great question. Uh, I guess we would ha I have to find out more about that, whether they have salt pumps or something. I don't know. And I wonder if they're isosmotic, you know, if they have the same salt content as the water around them. It's a good question. Um. One other question was, um, I've heard that rockweed strands add an air bladder a year. Is that true? Um, and the first thing, this would be a great fact to share with kids. Yes, totally true. So in the picture, if you are, if you have joined in, if you can see the picture, um, in the picture is a, a few strands of rockweed. The things on the side with the little white dots on them, those are receptacles, those are reproductive, but, um, sort of that bubble that's on the, the middle of a blade, that's an air bladder. And those get laid down every year. It takes, from the hold fast to the first one, actually, that takes a couple of years. So you have to be kind of careful with that. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, let's see. We answered some of our garden questions. Um, Someone asked about how to sustainably seaweed. I missed the question, sorry. Oh, someone asked about how to sustainably collect seaweed. Yeah, I, you know, it, it, takes, it takes work to understand um, the different life cycles of the different seaweeds. So it starts with an understanding of what the life cycle is and when they are reproductive and when they're non-reproductive. And it, it, goes, it goes from there. And I, that's a whole other talk and it, should, it would better be covered by people in the industry, whether they're hand harvesting or, or not. So like Micah Woodcock, who's up in the Deer Isle Stonington area, he would be a, a much better person to talk about sustainable harvest, you know, hand harvest of seaweed. We had one question about um, aquaculture, um, and this was, what are the challenges for lease applications with cultured seaweed? 
Uh, that's a question for the Department of Marine Resources. Um, certainly, there are there are some. It, it's 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 unfortunately like a lot of other aquaculture in that it, it sort of gets gets glommed in with with you know what's going on out there of a, of a of a concern of, about how our water resources are used and shared. Um, but really, you know, DMR, the Department of Marine Resources, is the permitting um, body and agency in the state, and and I would send you to them for that question. Um, someone asked, how what's the interaction between warming and nutrient loading and kelp? Um, so kelp do not grow well in warmer water. Um, for a whole bunch of different reasons. So we can load them up with a lot of nutrients and they will take up the nutrients and grow. But if the water is warm, they, they really just really don't do well. And so if we have warm water, it doesn't really kind of matter what we have for a nutrient load, which might be make them very happy because the warm water is going to make them very unhappy and they're not going to, to thrive. So warm water is really not a friend of kelps. So. Um, someone asked, can we trust that the seaweeds that are being gathered or farmed for food on the main coast are safe to eat? Yeah, so if, so going back to that whole metal and toxic question. Um, so let's take, for example, Maine Coast Sea Vegetables, which is a, a large harvester and processor here on this, in the state of Maine. Um, and they send out, they test all of their seaweed for the heavy metals, for any other you know, toxins that might be there, but largely for the heavy metals to, to make sure that they're not um, producing something that's going to make people sick. The same thing goes for um, the, the seaweed processors in the state who are using this for farm applications because they don't want anybody putting toxic chemicals or, or heavy metals really on, on gardens, on anything that they're growing. Um, so there is a lot of testing that goes on. Uh, and it, again, if you are thinking about foraging, you should just think about the locations in which you're foraging. Um, someone asked, are sea urchins a problem with seaweed? So in the past, urchins would have been a problem with kelp. And we might get like a whole urchin front moving through and just decimating whole kelp beds. Um, but when the urchins were fished back in the 80s, you know, the the stock of urchins plummeted and they really haven't recovered from that plummeting. And so um, now sort of Jonah crabs sort of eat little baby urchins. So they're really having a hard time rebounding from the, the fishing pressure. Um, if urchins rebounded, then one would assume that they would start mowing down kelp forests again. Um, but at the moment, Urchins just are not in enough of an abundance in the coast of Maine to be a problem. And we had just a couple more questions. One person mentioned that sometimes her neighborhood will smell really bad and she's been told it's seaweed. Um, if that's true, she was wondering why she might smell it one year, but then nothing for a number of years. Oof, I don't know. If it were seaweed, then I, I think, you know, is there a, a bigger, is there a bigger wash up to the rack than the not? And, you know, if, if people, if it gets turned over, um, then it might be, you know, it, it might be more smelly than other reasons. Um, it, you know, it, if it's breakdown is, is causing, you know, a different type of bacteria that are breaking it down and it could smell, you know, there could be a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, but I would guess that it's more a question about breakdown than it is about living seaweed. It's a good question though, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then I think our final question is, can you recommend a seaweed recipe book? Oh, 
Um, so there's a book, actually, I wish that I knew. There's one that just came out last year that I haven't read, so I don't know if it's any good, but it looks really good. I saw it at Sherman's and thought, ooh. Um, but Seaweeds by Ole Mortsen, he goes into sort of the history of seaweed and, and its uses and how we, how we related to it um, culturally, but then the whole back of the book is recipes and they're, and they're good. Um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. And Ben, I don't know if you had any other questions or if you wanna just close it out. Yeah, uh, actually just one more that came in through the private chat and it's also a book question. Uh, just wondering if you have any good children's books about seaweed that you might recommend. Mm. That's a good question. Not off the top of my head, but I think I would look for something because I don't, I can't think of the title of this, but, um, you know, so maybe had a book that came out maybe in the, maybe in the eighties, um, that follows, you know, somebody down to the shore. It's very main centric. I, it was a nice book. I feel as though Susan um, Shetterly might have a, co a companion, a, a young person's companion book to her Seaweed Chronicles, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Nothing is popping, like nothing is, is immediately popping to mind. Okay, to uh, yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, and we'll let me know if you think of anything. Yeah. If, and yeah. if you do, you can always send it out. But, uh, Awesome. Well, thank you so much. That was uh, yeah, really interesting, really informative. We all and uh, and we really appreciate you joining us tonight and, and talking to us about seaweed. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. So, awesome. thanks everybody. Go yeah. find some seaweed. All right. Thanks everyone. All right. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.